Welcome to the Logan Bartlett Show. What you're going to hear on this episode is a conversation I have with Tui Portmach. Now, Tui is the co-founder and CEO of Procore, a construction software company worth over $10 billion and doing almost a billion dollars in revenue today. Tui and I talk about a bunch of different things, including the early days of Procore, which involved bootstrapping for 12 to 13 years before ultimately getting to $10 million in annual recurring revenue and raising outside capital. All of the biggest inflection points in Procore came at our darkest hours. All of a sudden, you come up the other side and you realize you're running faster than you were before. Everyone is way more engaged. And then you have that aha moment that that was not actually a dark time. That was actually a very, very important time for this business. We then discussed the hockey stick growth that happened after that, growing to 4,000 people today. We talk about the need to manage people out of the organization when they're not scaling as quickly as the business, as well as what he's learned from mentors like Toby Lukey from Shopify, as well as Satya Nadella from Microsoft. Steve Zahn looked at me and he's like, look, if we don't get $30,000, right now, we are going to go out of business. The person said, how much does Procore cost? Mark goes, uh, $30,000 a year. And then we all sat back and the guy's like, all right, send me an invoice. A really fun conversation with Tui, one of my favorite ones to date that you'll hear now. We were just talking before we started here uh, that the valuation point, and it's, it's something that people get precious about, right? And bo on both sides, like it's not just VCs that are uh, trying to, I mean, it's sort of talking my own book being like, oh, well, valuations don't matter. Pick the partner you want to work with. But the journey of who you have on the ride with you is so important from an investor standpoint. And so it's funny to hear you don't even remember the traction or the ARR multiple or any of that stuff. No, you know, you remember the, by the way, I want to double tap on that. It is so important that you choose your, uh, that you choose your investors, right? I assume that was from the mistake you made picking Brian Feinstein. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, yeah. I'm more of an optimist. I'm the fact that Brian and Will are both still uh, investors in Procore and still on the board after 10 years or whatever uh, is a testament to how much, you know, it's, it's working out. So yeah, choose wisely, but you're right. Like, you know, I don't necessarily remember the, the details of like the negotiation particularly, but I, you know, I just remember the, um, you know, those milestones, like the billion dollar valuation, which is, um, you know, just something as a founder, you, a billion dollars is like, you never imagined that that was ever going to be something that you would ever be able to do. And when we came to terms with that, de with a, a deal that was at a billion dollars, I was like, it, it, it was just, um, it was one of those moments where fortunately I was with my leadership team that we were, and we, we kind of had it on speakerphone, but didn't, you know, didn't really announce that it was on speakerphone. When we, we put it on mute and then we all started like cheering and high-fiving that we had gotten here, uh, it's just those are the moments you remember. Well, in the journey, if you get too caught up on uh, the the end state, you'll lose sight of the the journey along the way. And I remember one of the best investments in my career. Uh, I was hung up on a ninety million dollar valuation, and they won a hundred. And we went back and forth. And now I share Nick season tickets with these guys. Yeah. They came to my bachelor party and I was just wrapped around the axle. I was like, no, 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 it's $90 million. <laughs> like that's the, that's the price I'm willing to pay a hundred. I'm out. Right. right. And, and I, I think about that at times when you're making the decision, it's sort of like, do you want to work with these people for the next 10 years or not? And sure, the valuations matter at the margin, but especially in the last 10 years, we've seen all the oscillations of like ARR multiples and valuations and all that stuff. And right. so you need the through line of like what, you know, the journey is going to look like. Right? And fortunately for me, I think I was luckier than smart on this one because though I'm, I'm pretty good with the, being a judge of people, I always say like uh, working with a, v, a venture capitalist is, is much more about the partner that you're going to work with than the, than the brand. But a funny story, one of the largest brands out there, it was like in 2009, 2010, long before we actually raised real institutional money. Uh, Steve Zahn, my co-founder, and I went up to Sand Hill Road and we walked into a firm and we pitched them. And uh, they, of course, put us in like the far back room with the, you know, the 22-year-old analyst or whatever that... The lights are they're like swinging back and forth. It looks like a prison interrogation <laughs> room or whatever. I'm like, is this a mop closet, you know? Yeah. But, uh, but uh, they, and at the end of the meeting, they're like, you know, that's really interesting. But um, if you could just pivot your business model to be more like Facebook. And I was thinking to myself, like, these people don't get it and they're not going to get it. But man, when I met Brian and when I met Will, uh, uh, I, they got it. And that's the other thing is I like people who are in love with the vision, right? And um, some other people were just in love with the, 
the business model. And that's, to me, not enough. It's hard. So so maybe describe for, for yeah. people we sort of dove right in. What, what does Procore do? So we are a construction uh, software company. We're a platform. Uh, and anybody who's ever done any construction themselves, like if they built something, uh, like remodeled a bathroom or whatever, realize that it's a highly complex and fraught with lots of challenges, mostly because it's a prototype. Your bathroom's never going to get rebuilt again. That nuclear power plant in Europe's never going to get built again. Uh, and so the complexity is just enormous. And now you have teams that are coming together. They've never worked together. So what Procore does is we provide this common layer, this common platform for data and managing these workflows that jump the different entities across these projects um, that just drive smooth um, uh, project uh, you know, budgets and, and schedules, safety, a lot of other things. And we've, we've now become... Uh, many more things than just that because we're a platform and we have tons of partners that help extend what we do. Yeah, I want to talk about the different products and modules and all that stuff. But originally, I guess, uh, it was kind of project management and collaboration for for building what was custom homes way yeah. back when and then became construction. And so I want to talk about that. There's a journey there. That, yes. that pivot there. But um, the slip of your line in the growth was yes. um, unusual. Uh, so it took you 12 to 15 years or so to reach... 10 million in ARR. Just, then, just south of it, yeah. Yeah, then yeah. three or four to reach 100, then yeah. another, I don't know, four or five to reach 500. So definitely an acceleration there. Um, I guess my question in that is there's, you can't ever start your company on the exact right day. No. I mean, maybe you can, maybe you're super lucky, but uh, you're either too early or you're too late. And if you're too early, your job's to survive. And if you're too late, your job's to catch up. I think it's safe Which to say you, you guys are, have? <laughs> you guys are too early. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so, so maybe, maybe take us through that, that journey of like, uh, 2000, early 2000s, starting the company and then, uh, hunkering down and trying to survive until the market cut up. Yeah. Um, the idea was, the idea was not too early. Uh, the concept, so I'd been working in the, in Silicon Valley doing some other technology work. Um, and what I saw was is the digitization of different in industries. And, and, and so I saw the opportunity in construction to digitize. And look, I, I knew the internet wasn't at the job site. And I knew that the average uh, construction management person graduating from a university is not going to be well-versed in technology. But I also knew that the industry and the processes that drove construction were so broken that this needed to happen. Uh, so I just started on the journey. And I, and I knew it was early, but I, and I was looking at the slope and I didn't know when we were going to hit that kind of tipping point. Uh, I thought it was going to happen fast, faster, but um, uh, I've just been this person that's, I just saw something that I just knew had to happen. And to me, it was much more about solving the problem than it was about growing a, a big business. Uh, so there wasn't really a lot of like lamenting, the, wow, we haven't hit a tipping point yet, uh, moments along the way. Now, there were times when we couldn't make payroll and, you know, times were tough, but like, I still just believed in it. So I, I just kept doing it. And thank goodness I had a wife who didn't divorce me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, so there's the, there's yeah. the picking the inevitability of something. And, and it's an interesting thing that I do as an exercise oftentimes is like, do I think this will happen? Mm -hmm. And you can get bogged down in the the timing of like why now and all that stuff. But if you think it's an inevitability, then it probably makes sense to get on the the ride on that journey. So it sounds like you guys were early there, but you you referenced um, not being able to make payroll. Were there times that you didn't think Procore would survive, or what was the closest you no, came? No, I, I just need, needed to get out and raise some more money. <laughs> Frankly, I I would never believe that we weren't going to survive. Well, I should say. There was an existential crisis uh, in 2008, 2009, where uh, even our most um, uh, loving investors were like, we're not putting any money into construction technology. This, the, the world is falling apart. Uh, except for one, this gentleman, Kevin O'Connor, who's the founder of DoubleClick. Hmm. Uh, he, uh, he got it. And uh, funny story about how I raised that money. But I was within hours of not being able to make payroll. And he was in the South China Sea on a cruise ship with his wife. And by the way, if you've ever had a challenge of trying to reach an investor, try calling a cruise ship, right? It's almost impossible, but I figured it out. I got him. He wired us some money. We made payroll, but he was my last call. I didn't know who else to call after him. And thank goodness he answered. And thank goodness he was uh, in the casino and it was midnight uh, when he got the phone call because I think he was probably a little more uh, um, 
open to the investment. Yes, yeah, amenable <laughs> to uh, the circumstances. Yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah. Th- thank God for I don't know the blackjack hands that he got. To feel he may have just won a few. Yeah, yeah good, exactly. Good. The roulette wheel was spinning his direction. Uh, um, <laughs> so were, there were things you did to try to move the market along, including like installing Wi-Fi on job sites. And was that for when you look back, was that just for your sanity at the end of the day? And there's really willing the market into existence was just to keep moving forward? Or do you think anything actually helped moving the market? So I was having a hard time proving the business model because there was no internet at the job site. So my my business idea wasn't about the internet at the job site. It was about providing you know data access to people at the job site. So in order for me to kind of prove my idea, like I just had to brute force getting the internet to the job site. But I will tell you when I, so when we flew into, it was, I think it was in um, South Carolina, when we flew in uh, to, to South Carolina to go do that, that this, is, this was the very first one we did. Um, we went to you know, Home Depot and got a toolbox, which was going to be the waterproof housing. Then we went to CompUSA and bought a, bought a router and a modem. And I remember climbing up the, la- I borrowed a ladder from the electrician on the job site. Remember, this is, a, um, this, is, this is a dirt lot that has a temporary power pole in it. So I'm climbing up this ladder and I'm thinking to myself, this probably looks really stupid. Like, you know, why, you know, we're charging like $95 a month and we're doing this. But I just had to be able to prove. And fortunately for us, we installed it on the job site of a, of a gentleman who uh, was really, really um, uh, excited about the business model. He ended up investing in Procore uh, and he told the world about it. So it was worth it. But boy, I felt silly at the time. Yeah, going and we up did, there. We did, and by the way, I mean, my, my, I really got the start in, on the south side of LA, uh, working with some kind of the Hollywood folks um, in the in their residences, and we installed every single one of those. We installed the internet at the job site, you know, crawling underneath trailers and stuff. Well, and, and it was Ben Stiller and Barbara Streisand, right? Like, it was that the, the first next... one was first one was Ben Stiller, uh, second one was Eddie Murphy, uh, and then it was a whole ca- cascade. The Barbara Streisand one stood out because she was so cool. Yeah, like. I, and, you know, and she was cool on site. Like, yeah, like like I, I, she has kind of a, a reputation for maybe not being so easy. Mm. She was the coolest person I'd ever worked with. And I was like, that, that, I just remember that one because she sat us by the pool and served us ICN cookies. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, 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 so the business model evolution, so you were doing these custom homes for celebrities, essentially, right? I'm sure not, that wasn't your TAM, but uh, it, it was a lot of big houses, I assume. Well, what it was, was there's a, there was, a, there still is today a handful of large custom home builders in Los Angeles that, that, that cater to the celebrities and the high net worth people down there. So I was working with those general contractors who would bring me to these celebrity sites. And what year was this? 2001. 2001. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so after the uh, internet bubble popped and, you, um, and so what, uh, what was the evolution in going from these custom homes in LA to construction? Well, I, I, the first, well, that is construction. But commercial, commercial, commercial yeah. construction. Yeah. So uh, w- the first kind of aha moment I had was I remember standing up on the roof of Eddie Murphy's house in Beverly Park. And uh, I looked, uh, th- he had two structures and I looked down on one structure. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been, well, you have, you're in New York. If you look down on a building below you, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of air conditioning unit on the roof of all those high rises, right? I looked down at Eddie Murphy's house and, I, and what I was looking at was what I thought would look like, you know, enough air conditioning unit for a casino. <laughs> And I'm like, wow, this is, this is not a residential project by any stretch. This is definitely a, and it was all commercial grade equipment. I'm like, we're actually doing commercial construction. And I didn't really think we were. And that's when the kind of the, the bit flipped. And I'm like, wait a minute, we don't have to be limited to high end residential. Uh, and there was a few missteps along the way, but we finally were able to enter. It's that funny, segment. Eddie Murphy's house was equipped like a commercial uh, building. building. Yeah, yeah. That's I think funny. he had 23 air handlers on his roof. Wow. Yeah. I mean, most people have one. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you, so you saw that and then it was the global financial crisis that you were actually kind of forced to, to find your way into that market in a more uh, meaningful way. Yeah. We had a customer that was building a, uh, what's called mixed use, but it was residential upstairs and commercial downstairs. And we were really focused on the residential part of it. And uh, then we realized, well, wait a minute, they're doing all this commercial work. Uh, and I'll never forget Steve Zahn, my co-founder and I were in a, we were talking about like, what are we going to do? All of our custom home builders are going out of business. Like, and it was, uh, I don't know how much you remember of all this, but it was, um, nothing happened slowly in that time. Like people were, you know, every day, five customers would call and be like, you know, sorry, but I'm out of business. And so we're like, kind of like, what are we going to do? And we're like, let's just start calling, uh, commercial contractors. Uh, and we, we did, and we, um, uh, fortunately found a lot of early adopters that wanted to to go with us. That was another one of those where we were just skimming the wave tops. Yeah. But uh, 
I'll never forget too. So our pricing model was uh, $95 a month per project. And of course, that, does, that doesn't make payroll very well. So uh, Steve Zom looked at me and he's like, look, if we don't get $30,000 right now, we are going to go out of business. So we're in this little tiny rental, uh, office rental, and we're probably like 12 employees. And uh, Mark Lyons, our sales rep, our one and only sales rep, called a, a lead that was in Salesforce. And at the end of the demo, we we're all standing around this computer. This is before you did WebEx or whatever. It was just a phone call. Um, he, he was um, uh, talking about the benefits of Procore. The person said, how much does Procore cost? And, Mar and Steve goes, so Mark goes, uh, $30,000 a year. And then we all sat back and the guy's like, all right, send me an invoice. We're going to make payroll. Uh, so that's actually how we uh, kind of, we actually changed our pricing model at that moment. And on moved, the fly. On the fly. Yeah. yeah. So, so the global financial crisis proved to be, uh, I'm sure at the time it, it felt like a major headwind uh, to your business and you were kind of iterating, but it twofold, I, I guess it helped you uh, find your way to commercial construction in a more meaningful way. Like wh what is it? Um, opportunity is the mother of invention Vention. or whatever. It yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, it also, a lot of competitors didn't survive there. Was there a recognition at that moment that this was actually an opportunity or was it just? Uh... No, because we were trying to survive. But what was interesting was the, the before we went into the, um, the global financial crisis, we were, um, we were in a sea of a lot of people that had the same idea. Uh, and there was a lot of them. And there were, there were companies that were bigger than us, more established. They had bigger customer brands associated with them. Um, and it was really interesting because when you really are focused on what you're doing, trying to save the business, trying to survive, you don't really take a lot of time to put, poke your head up and look around. And, it, and w on the backside, when we came up, literally the landscape was empty. I don't, do you surf at all? I don't. So there's a thing called duck diving, which is you, 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 know, you d dive your board under a wave that's broken and you come up the, back, uh, up the other side. I, I always just have this mental image is that like, you know, the sea is full of surfers. We all duck dive. I come up the other side, I look around and no one else is there. Right? And that's kind of how the, the landscape looked at the time. It was barren. Probably an interesting uh, internalization for people that are um, burrowing down right now as founders and trying to get through what, uh, this is an interesting market to say the least right now. It's uh, definitely been manic over the last couple of years, but um, the incremental venture back startup that has been funded in the last couple of years that you're competing with going away could actually uh, really present the opportunity if you can survive this period of time. Right? Well, but by the way, I think that's probably a great thing for think founders to think about, which is all of the all of the biggest inflection points in Procore came at our darkest hours. And you don't really think of it that way as a founder. You think it's a dark hour. But the reality is things are changing so rapidly that if you can actually adjust to the new world very quickly, you will uh, accelerate your um, all of your vision that much faster. Are there any other ones other than the global financial crisis that stand out? I assume COVID maybe is another one. COVID was definitely one. Um, there, you know, there was also one around, it's kind of somewhat adjacent to this, but it was around culture, right? We, we got to a certain point uh, when we moved to this campus in I think 2013 or 14, we were like 60 or 80 employees. Enough that it was like too much for me to know everybody really, really well and you know, at a certain point, you know, early on, you know, not only the, the person that's working for you, but you know, their spouse and their dog's name and everything else. At that point, I was starting to kind of uh, not be able to know everybody as well as I could. And so we were deciding that we were going to, um, that we were going to um, establish our mission, vision and values so we can actually scale the business. And um, it was during that time that we, you know, uh, we made some hiring mistakes because we hadn't really established all of that yet. As a founder, you really have to develop very early on the skills of hiring great talent, but also being able to get rid of talent that's not effective. And I remember we were kind of in a crisis mode. We'd hired some wrong people and I needed to make some, some drastic changes. Um, and when I did, lots of great things happened, right? So you, 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 you struggle with making these decisions and having these conversations, but all of a sudden you come up the other side and you realize, you're running faster than you were before. Everyone is way more engaged because these people are actually slowing you down. And then you have the aha moment that that was not actually a dark time. That was actually a very, very important time for this business. It, because any bad, I mean, this is obvious to any founder, but I'm sure you live this, any single bad employee, it spreads. It's like cancer. They then hire the next person and the culture starts to drift away. You guys went as far as to, Steve became, or his title now is chief cultural officer, right? Yeah, he's chief culture officer, but he also, he does so much more for Procore, but he's kind of my 
head sales guy these days, but mm. he's a, uh, yeah, but yes, that is, he's primarily, I, 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 yeah, but I want to make sure that everyone's clear. He is not the owner of culture, uh, but what he does is he's the ambassador for culture to ensure that everyone has the tools that they need to carry our culture forward, but yes. So did you go through and at that point in time codify like what the values were and what had drifted from it? Or what did you do other than managing those people out? Yeah. Like what, what, what was the uh, post-mortem changes you made? So we, we, uh, we shut the business down for two whole days, which by the way, um, when you were 60 people and you're barely making payroll, that's a, a big, but I'm like, I want to get this right. I used to work in Silicon Valley for, uh, in HR software, which had nothing to do with this industry. And, uh, I would just see these businesses that had horrible cultures. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to ever grow that. I want to make sure we get this right. So we t- went off site and we, we facilitated a, a, a meeting with our, I think our leaders at the time was like 10 people. And we went through our mission, our vision, and our values, and um, and, and it, it basically codified who we were. Uh, and it's a process, but it's really important. In fact, we do a thing called Culture Academy here, where we bring our people that build on our platform, our partners. Um, we bring in the 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 ones that are most engaged and uh, adopted by our customers onto campus, like I think twice a year, and we help them build their mission, vision, and values hmm. uh, because it's so critical at the early stage to get that right. Hiring against it, do you end up breaking people into different teams that assess certain elements of the culture, or is there a single person that's responsible for holistically? Will they fit into the culture, or how, how do you actually actualize it? At different stages, uh, we did different things. Early on, it, you know, Steve and I were doing all of it, and as we grew, we would find uh, folks that were uh, really good at certain aspects of it. But you also, you, you know, early on, you have to still test for aptitude. So you really, you know, at our scale today, if you're you know, if your resume makes it to our desk, you, you pretty much have the skill set to do the job. So we really now focus mostly on the, the kind of the values hiring. Uh, but as we grew, uh, it became more and more um, uh, kind of, it was really more like, hey, Gabe, who is running our, our uh, customer success group, he is really, really good with openness and ownership. Like he's really good at, and so we would put him on it. And it was a gang tackle. But we would even do things like, um, when we had a candidate come into LAX to come up to Santa Barbara to interview for a job, um, the the car service that would pick them up is actually a friend of mine. And so he would drive them up and he would over, overhear their conversations and he would hear how, he would, he would tell me how they treated him as the driver. Um, and so long before that candidate actually got here, I knew all about how, like what they were really like and if they were really living our values or if they weren't. So we tried every tactic in the book to make sure we didn't get it wrong. What specifically broke? Like what was the red blinking light at that point in time? I don't think, well, like I said, we had made some some challenging hires, um, but it was less what broke. It was more about, I had so much faith in where this business was going that I knew if we didn't get the foundation right, it, we were going to have a real hard time. Those businesses I was working for in the Bay Area when I was doing HR software were, were Fortune 50 companies. Most of them had fundamentally broken cultures mm. and they couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And I'm like, I don't want to get to the point where I'm fixing my culture. So if we just start with people, because people are the root of all your culture, and get that right, then we won't have to fix the problem later. If you're a founder and maybe you feel... Uh that there's some element of this, or you're asking yourself, hey, there's five or eight people that I don't know if they totally fit in, but they're, you know, they're doing a good job and they're high performant or whatever. Is there any question you would ask yourself? Uh, like, hey, if you're asking the question, the answer is probably yes, or yeah. something along those lines that, that you would recommend? So I mentor some founders uh, and across the board, everyone is, uh, has, especially the younger ones, have not developed the skills of how to assess and jettison uh, people that aren't working. Uh, and they will make all of these mental gymnastics around why they should keep the person. Uh, that is a fundamental flaw because th- across the board, they will eventually fail. And you, so really what you're doing is you're just extending the amount of damage that this person is going to do to your business. Because ultimately what you want is you want it you want a force multiplier in that seat that's not going to just, obviously, you don't want them to slow you down. You want them to actually accelerate you and make you better. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I tell founders all the time, like, do not make excuses. You, by the way, we all know, and they all know what the right answer is. It's just hard to do the work. Um, you know, it's funny, and I've had to say goodbye to lots and lots of people over the years as this company grew. Um, but I've always told myself that ultimately, Procore is bigger than me and it's bigger than them. Uh, and if we are going to deliver on the promise, we have to make difficult choices. And, you know, 
um, I'm not excluded from that. If I'm not doing my job or there's somebody that's better to do this job than I am, I, I trust and I know the board will, will make that change and it's not personal. Hmm. I, I've heard you say specifically that you hire for a certain set of traits, which are hungry, humble, and smart. And smart. Yeah. Um, how, how do you think about this? And are there interview questions that, that you've, oh, yeah. you've operationalized? Well, well, so as I mentioned, the uh, the driver, by the way, I'm giving all my tactics away. So now people yeah, that hire uh, me This will be a court. primer to, <laughs> to trick you at this point. The but. driver uh, is uh, definitely on the humble side. Like, is this person actually who they kind of come across to be? The driver's assessing that. That's the driver's giving me all of that yeah. on the way up. Um, we're generally, the smart's not a problem because, again, if you if you come in into Procore, you you've demonstrated that you've made you've had success somewhere. Um, but the hunger too is really uh, important. And what I've found is you can find hungry and smart, but you tend to get you're going to probably get an asshole, right? Uh, you need the humble in there, uh, and you can get the you know hungry and humble, but if they're not smart enough to do so, in other words, that triumvirate you have to have all three of them, and you can't compromise on them ever. But it really works. And I love, I just love simple paradigms like that, that you can kind of live by. And by the way, I actually, that's how I choose my friends too, frankly. Mm. Uh, there's something about it that um, uh, just works. Yeah. So, so smart is a certain level of competency and you could probably look at, you know, whatever, different resume related things on, on that, or maybe it just comes out in the conversation. Uh, the humble side, you've got your, your uh, driver that helps on that. What about what about hungry? Like that's our- the hardest one. The the uh, it's funny. I was having this conversation at dinner last night with one of our customers. But uh, yeah, how everyone claims to be hungry, uh, but but are they? Uh, and um, it's very hard to assess that. What I normally do is I spend a lot of time on curiosity because the more um, the more curious somebody is, usually the more kind of energy they're going to bring to their job because they just are curious. So I spend a lot of time in the interview process just talking about what people are passionate about hmm. and, and see if they, um, if they are, have a hunger around something outside of Procore. Uh, and, and usually that comes out pretty quickly. If they yeah, I, I've sort of found that there's, um, there's football players and basketball players. And football players, you tell them what to do and yeah. they execute on it. And that has a good role. Basketball players, you need to be able to move and create and all that. And within an organization, especially in the early days, if you uh, if you can't create and juke and jive and go with the flow on stuff, it's going to be really hard for that person to be successful. And so one of the questions I'll always ask is like, what is an entrepreneurial thing that you took from zero to one? And it yeah. doesn't matter if you're an investment banking first year analyst or you're whatever, you're yeah. an executive. If you've never taken something from zero to one, organizationally in some way, you're probably not going to make it in a startup or a venture job as well. Venture, like, you know, our calendar is blank every day and you need to justify something to keep going. It could be a podcast. It could be, you know, meeting the incremental founder and all that. But if you don't have that, it's really hard to start. Yeah, it's funny. We, um, we were fortunate when we first started as we found a lot of, by the way, uh, motivate, there's, there's a lot of things that motivate people to kind of have that hunger in them. Uh, and also wanting to kind of prove that they can do something. They have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. So we're sitting here in Santa Barbara, California, right? The ocean's right there. UCSB is where we hired most of our um, early people from. Um, and a lot of those folks come from towns like Fresno, California, Bakersfield, California, you know, places where these kids who've gone to school here for four years, learn how to surf, love the beach or whatever, they graduate and they had the fear of God comes over and they're like, oh my God, I got to go back to Fresno or Bakersfield. I don't want to go. Um, and so we would find these people that would do anything to stay in, in this town. And, uh, and so you find that by itself just separates people, which is these are the people that will fight and scrape to make something happen uh, in the absence of, of, of uh, you know, any help on, hmm. from outside. I heard you say something interesting about the risk in starting a company. And uh, I think what you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you need to have a unique insight and a non-consensus view of something that's gonna happen but that the number of things you need to believe will happen is exponentially correlated with the risk of the opportunity. Yep. It's sort of a, uh, it's it's intuitive when you think about it, but like the number of things you need to believe, there's this Andy Ratcliffe quote about like, uh, or, or view that uh, there's an onion and each time you're trying to peel layers off the onion uh, to de-risk the opportunity. Right. How, do, how do you think about that and how does it relate to Procore? Well, uh, a lot of things had to go right, right? Um, by the way, I, I heard I, I stole that from a. I don't know if you listen to the Acquired podcast. But yeah, of I, course. I, I, I forget if it was Charlie Munger. Maybe some. By the way, I, I'm such a huge Charlie Munger fan. Yeah, who, so sad. Who isn't? He, yeah, so sad that he passed away. But um, 
Uh, but taking that concept, it really kind of struck a chord with me because uh, <laughs> so many things would had to have happened in order to make Procourse, you know, actually work. The fact that there was no internet at the job site was a huge deal for, you know, you think about it. Um, the 3G was really what, what actually allowed the internet to get to the job site. That didn't happen for like, I don't know, eight years uh, until after we started the company. So so, so many things had to happen. You had to, you had to have that. You had to have, um, you know, kids that had graduated from college that were kind of pressing and adopting for technology. You really had to have the iPhone. You had to, in 2007, you had to have the iPad in 2011. All these things had to happen. We had to survive. We had to make payroll. It's kind of uh, a little scary when you kind of rewind the tape, the game tape, and you're like, wow, like we had to fly through so many, you know, small apertures in order to make this, this, this work. Um, and so I, I guess I think of it that way. I'm kind of glad I didn't think of it that way back then because I might, it might have been too daunting for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A lot of different things had to go right along the way. Hey guys, this is Rashad. I work with Logan on the show and I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about Redpoint's other podcast, Unsupervised Learning. Unsupervised Learning is our AI podcast where we interview guests from companies like Perplexity, OpenAI, Adobe, and many others about the topical things that are happening in the very, very rapidly developing landscape of AI. So if you're interested in going deeper, uh, check out the link in this description for our YouTube channel, but also wherever you get your podcasts. So back to the show. We talked a little bit about the number of competitors you guys had in the early days. Um, some did survive, I, I assume, and some new ones entered the market. From an execution standpoint, how did you beat the other people in the market? Well, a uh, <laughs> couple things. One was we got really lucky to be to be a platform in 2002. If you think about it, like um, SaaS wasn't even a, there wasn't even a word called SaaS, right? Um, but we we kind of ended up being a platform by accident. When I started Procore, uh, I, I was used to in Silicon Valley in these Fortune 500, Fortune 50 companies, we would show up on site and we would install an Oracle database, right? Well, this is these are Fortune 50 companies; they can afford Oracle databases. Uh, but when I started Procore, the thought of, well, I, I, I couldn't afford to spin up an Oracle database for every one of our new customers that was paying us $95 a month. So what I had to do was create a single instance of a, of a code base in a, uh, in a single, on a single server. Um, and I did that by just putting a, a company ID in front of every database table that I had created in the database. Um, and so we got kind of, kind of lucky that, um, that that actually happened uh, very early on in our journey. Um, and so, so being a platform allowed us to scale. So that, I mean, what, the next sorry customer. to interrupt you, but what does a platform actually mean in this regard? Right? Yeah. It, it's a it, single backend database or a bunch of constituents in it or ability to build applications? It's a single code base, uh, multi-tenant architecture uh, that really allowed me to run the entire business off of, off of a single server at the time. So if uh, my next incremental customer, all I had to do was add an incremental count to the company ID in the database and you know, I could spin them up. So the, so the incremental cost to bringing them online was next to zero. And there's probably something about like the core operating system as well that, that allows you to then build modules on the extension. Is, is yes. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I certainly am not the best engineer in the world, uh, and, uh, but I got it right. I got it right enough, I guess, is the right way to put, put it. Uh, so that allows, so being, you know, being able to spin up a customer quickly, very inexpensively, was a competitive advantage that are most of the people that were doing what we we're doing were not doing that. They were, you know, they were doing a hosted solution where each customer would get their own instance of the of the code base, and, and I think that was a big boat anchor on on our competitors. And, and by the way, not to uh, sometimes people are dismissive of of competitors and that, but that probably made sense from their vantage point because they were servicing, I, I assume, maybe a higher end of the market, and so they could build the custom stuff. No, or? actually. Um, by the way, I, I actually think it, that was just what you did, right? There was no other motion. Nobody at that time, I, I shouldn't say nobody. I think there was a couple companies in the Bay Area that were doing this. I mean, obviously Salesforce had, had done this, but it, it, the, the, the pattern um, for this particular business model had not really been established yet. So, and again, I, I, I did it only because that was the only thing I could afford to do. Uh, if I had more money and I had more momentum with the business early on, I probably would have chosen the other architecture because it was the it was the predominant architecture of the time. Hmm. So, so you raised uh, you raised from Angels and uh, Kevin O'Connor and a few other folks along the way. But your first institutional round came from Bessemer in what year was that? 2015, I think. 2015, and you were at about 9.6 million in about I say 
I, I think you were, uh, I have down here very precisely 9.6 billion million in Sounds revenue right at me. that point in time. What led you to pursuing outside investment from an institutional investor? I'll, I'll never forget. We were, uh, Steve Zahm and I were, we were talking about the fact that we actually, there's a, t hopefully there's a time in all founders um, experience where their passion starts to see like green shoots where you're like, wait a minute, you know, not only do I believe in this, but like other people believe in this and they're actually you know paying me money. And um, I think Steve kind of made fun of me because I'm I'm a product CEO first and foremost, like, and I'm just I love the customer and the product. Um, you know, Steve kind of made fun of me one day where he's like, you know, we ought to probably try to sell this software. <laughs> like, you know, you're building the software and you're you know driving in your Jeep Grand Cherokee down, knocking on trailer doors, and you know we, whatever. But I think it's time that we actually start doing this. And um, and so I'm like, okay, well, I've never done this before. Steve had taken his last company public, a company called Digital Think. So fortunately for me, I paired myself with somebody who was far smarter than me and had a lot more experience in this world than I, I did. And so Steve basically laid the groundwork for this process. Um, and we thought, you know what, if we could ladle some capital onto this business, we have proven that the folks that are buying our software love it, uh, but no one knows about it. So like the, it, the, the obvious in investment need was to kind of spread the word. And, and I think that's, that's where like Bessemer uh, and, and Iconic both came in and they're like, wow, this is, you know, they would do customer calls and whatever. And they're like, this is a company that just really needs a go-to-market engine. And if they do, this might be something big. Hmm. So, so at that point in time, um, I, I think I heard you say Bessemer uh, underwrote the outcome or like the upside case to 300 million, uh, like as an acquisition or something. And now, uh, whatever, eight years later, you're doing... 2x that and recurring revenue alone or something uh, close three. three three excuse me yeah three x that and um as you sort of zoomed out and went and got poked and prodded by uh different investors at that point in time like what when you dreamed the dream was 300 million the the number that made sense or what were you th i'm sure it wasn't 900 million in recurring revenue but no um if i rewind the game tape a little bit like two years prior to that i'll never forget we were in a really small office in montecito where um, we were before this campus and Steve Zahn was standing in his office. I think we probably had maybe 12 employees or whatever. And I walked in and he was like writing on his whiteboard a whole bunch of numbers. And he said to me, he goes, hey, Tui, I really think that this business someday could be worth $100 million. And I was like, you're shitting me. There's no way. Like, you know, and he's like, no. And by the way, I always look to Steve as he's the Stanford grad. He's, you know, he went to Haas. He's like, he knows the answers, right? I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Uh, and so then fast forward a couple of years, now we're up talking to Bessemer and everyone else. And um, by the way, I didn't know about this $300 million um, story, which by the, I got in trouble, by the way, for saying this. I wasn't supposed to know this. And oh, so funny. somebody on the inside told me this. And so anyway, but I've said it, so I'm going to say yeah, it. Yeah, it's in public it's record. It's in public record yeah. now, so I'm going to say it. But, I'm um, going to edit all, out all the nice things about Bessemer and Iconic, and I'm going to put in all the, you know, <laughs> the underestimating of you guys in there. So. <laughs> So anyhow, um, you know, I didn't really know what their investment thesis was, of course, because that's not really shared with us. But um, I had a feeling this could be big. I, I, I never in my wildest dreams uh, envisioned this. Um, so, uh, you know, good, good on them. If they thought we were worth, you know, the possible $300 million in the future, then, you know, they had a good, they had a good eye. Yeah, well, I want to come back to the founder journey uh, in a bit. But um, operating the business now, how many people do you guys have? Um, I, south of 4,000. South of 4,000. Yep. And uh, in 2015, it was... I think it was like 90, 90. Six, between 60 and 90. Something yeah, like so, so in nine years, uh, quite an exponential uh, growth. So I um, one of the things, I guess there's two different approaches to leadership and style. One is that you try to shore up your weaknesses and one is you hire people to, to augment your weaknesses. Yeah. Which, which one of those two do you, uh, do you believe in more? It's not a binary answer. Uh, I think it's an 80-20 rule, but I, I think 80% you have to hi hire for to augment your weaknesses. Um, I do think that if you're going to be successful as an individual in life and in business and everything else, you have to have a desire to grow personally. Uh, so I think you can't, it can't be 100-0. Um, but I, I, uh, I do believe that one of my strengths is recognizing my weaknesses. And knowing who to surround, finding Steve Zahm, for instance, I'm, I'm, you know, Procore would have been out of business long ago if I was in charge of the checkbook, right? Because I was, all I want to do is build product and satisfy customers' needs. Uh, so no, I think it's really important that you surround yourself uh, with people that actually do augment that. And you know, the biggest privilege 
Logan, is that I have at this scale, I come to work every day and I'm, I'm, I'm literally humbled and kind of blown away by the, uh, the caliber of the talent that I'm able to surround myself with because of the, the, the success we've had. Um, it's really re rewarding and I'm learning every single day and I've, I love it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things I also heard is you've removed yourself from deal negotiations with customers. When, when did that happen and why did you do it? Uh, there's two stories. There's the, there, there's a behind that. One is that, uh, it was just probably about five. Actually, you know what? It's probably more, it's, uh, it's probably like seven or eight years ago. Uh, I was the primary deal negotiator, right? Um, and I, I think I had been in too many difficult negotiations where at the end, I didn't have a great relationship with my buyer. And so I was a, a partner. And so I, I, I had the revelation. Plus, I had brought on Dennis Landers, the head of, head of sales, and he was so good. And you know, he understood the whole process of the, the science behind selling. And mine was much more relationship building. So I saw him do it. And I'm like, I want him to do that. Plus, I really wanted to develop a, a strong personal partnership connection with my peer uh, and not have it be a, um, a transactional uh, relationship. And the model then and uh, very similar to today was uh, uh, we re renew most of our customers on an annual basis. I didn't want to have to like put on my sales hat and go do it. I have a much... Um, deeper relationship with our customers because I don't do this because they know when I call them, I'm not trying to sell them something. Hmm. Um, and it's, uh, yeah. And by the way, the business doesn't suffer for it. Now I did, they, they do actually let me spike the ball, which is fun. So they'll do all this hard work and these long deal cycles or whatever. Towards the end, I'm building relationships with their executives and they'll let me come in and like, you know, ring the bell. And, You're holding the jumbo check. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, and I feel like I did all the work and but of course, all the people yeah, that, did the, other, the rest of the work. That's good. Um, you've been fortunate enough to have some uh, very impressive mentors in the technology ecosystem, one of which uh, Toby Lukey from Shopify. And I'd heard he imparted some advice that uh, I'd be curious your perspective on, but involving, and you alluded to this earlier, that you're not immune from um, if you're not performing, potentially being replaced. But there's a slope of the line of the company and then there's the slope of the line that you need to grow at as the leader of the business. How do you think about that and how has that advice impacted you? It's funny, um, it's not just the leader. Everybody at the business has got to grow at the same... It, it, actually, his, his advice was too, if the business is growing 100% a year, you and your team's skill set has to grow beyond that, right? Yeah. That's not going to be enough to grow at 100%, which by the way is, is hard. Um, and so uh, that really struck, uh, stuck with me as uh, time went on that, um, there's never a time to be complacent in your growth. Uh, and so I, till this day, I look at myself every day and, you know, what am I doing to, you know, be a better leader? Mm. Um, and so, uh, you never, you're never done with it. The sad part about it is, is that you end up having to say goodbye to a lot of people along the way that, that got you here. And I think there's a real art to how you uh, make those separations. Um, and I think we're pretty good at it, but um, you have to be real. And, you know, um, some people, some founders think that they're going to kind of keep people around and just give them a kind of a soft landing. It is a, the worst thing you can do. You, you need to be direct and honest and open with your employees. If they're not scaling, just say, Hey, I'm going to help you find another job somewhere else. And we call them graduates. People are going to graduate from here and go mm. somewhere else. And, um, you know, but yes, you have to be prepared to make those changes because not everybody, I mean, frankly, most people can't scale at that pace. Um, somebody said to me the other, the other day, like, there's not a lot of founders out there that are running a billion dollar business that they founded because it takes such a completely different skill set. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time trying to develop mm. those skills. And really part of it is not only the skills you develop, but the skills that you leave behind right? What, what got me here in the early days is kinetic energy of doing everybody's job for them and running in a million miles an hour in different directions. It is not effective hmm. at scale. The tactical insight from that point, because it's a very hard moment in the journey that you're talking about of the executives that got you there aren't going to be who gets you there in the, in the future. So it sounds like being real with them about it, not trying to, you know, dance around it. Um, and actually moving on, graduating them from the company rather than trying to repurpose them. Uh, are those the, the fair uh, insights? Is there anything else that you guys have learned about how to do it? Well, I, I, I got, uh, so yes, one piece that kind of helps me with this was um, um, I have the opportunity uh, once a quarter to talk to Satya Nadella as a mentor. 
And I, one of the very first pieces of advice, I was kind of struggling with my leadership team and thinking about like, how do I think about my leadership team? I mean, at the time we were a much smaller company, but we're here in Santa Barbara and I don't have, I don't have exposure to a lot of different um, kind of peers uh, in the same scale and situation that I was in. And I said, how do you think about this? How do you think about your team? And he goes, it's really hard to, um, you know, really assess your team because you're so close to them. He said, so what I, what he does, and he goes, what I think you should do is always be in conversations with peers of your leaders. Um, so like once a quarter, have a conversation with a head people officer somewhere else that you respect and admire, a uh, chief revenue officer somewhere else that you respect and admire. Um, and it really helps create a, and by the way, this is, I wish I, I wish I had known him many, many years ago and I'd done this earlier. Uh, uh, it really helps to create a contrast between who you have in the seat versus what's available out in the market or maybe not even available, but what's out there in the market. Uh, and it helps you get um, to uh, a real decision very quickly as to the, the skill and the scale of your talent that you have on hand. So having that piece, uh, that tool in my toolbox really, really works. How do you keep your um, employees motivated to the ambition of where the company is and where it needs to go? Because if you're in San Francisco, you're, you have OpenAI over there and you have Stripe over here and you have yep. Facebook down the corner and Apple and all that. But um, here, Procore in Santa Barbara is the huge fish. And I'm sure when they go home uh, to their, or go out to drinking with their buddies, like, you know, they've, they've made it. They're at a far bigger scale of a business than a lot of the other local companies, not to say there aren't other good businesses here, but keeping them aware that the mission is beyond, you know, what, what they see in Santa Barbara, but it's a global ambition. Is there any way that you found to do that? Well, it's probably the hardest thing you can do. Uh, but in the early days, it's easier because everyone, everyone feels, um, it's us against the world, right? So it's, so, but driving a sense of purpose into your, uh, organization where, you know, the average um, tenure at Procore is, you know, less than five years, right? So how do you get, how do you get these folks, you know, engaged? Uh, and it's, there's not one trick, right? But it does start with hiring the right people. Um, I, I, Steve has this thing, which is uh, the team hires and fires. So you, you really do, you have to assemble the right groups of people in order to make it to be a place that people want to come to every day. Uh, and so hiring to the values really matters. But driving a sense of purpose into the organization through your mission and vision, we have a lot of people here that really do believe in what we're trying to do here, improve the lives of everyone in construction, um, as well as just um, being engaged. And the engagement, one of the big tricks that we have is um, we encourage every Procore employee to go to job sites. Just go sit in the job site trailer for a half day and learn, you know, see the whites of the eyes of the person whose problems you're solving for. Uh, and you will, the people that we hire tend to be like, I'm in this, I'm going to solve for this. And great, a couple of great examples. One is uh, we send engineers to job sites, uh, you know, and instead of sitting in the darkness of their engineering room, they're sitting around job sites watching the people use the software that they build every day. We tend to get engineers that will, so there may be a, a, a feature enhancement that customers have been asking for for a while. Engineer sees it in real life. They will code and ship that code on an airplane on the way home from that job <laughs> site, right? Because they're so, because that level of engagement is so high. Today, we have uh, 36 of our largest customers here on site. Um, and uh, I'm encouraging everybody that possibly can be here at Procore to be in that room to really get a sense of what they are. So driving a sense of purpose and engagement is, it's hard. Um, and, you know, it's, like I said, it's easy in the early days. The real trick is when you're shifting from first into second gear, which is we are now big enough where people might not get it or whatever. So you have to really do everything you can to drive that kind of engagement and not assume that there, there's a better job offer right down the road that somebody might, might take. Yeah. It's sort of like, um, families with generational wealth, like the first one makes it second one saw how hard they worked and the third one messes it up and blows it. You know, it's one of those things you got to be cognizant of. How My hard grandfather used to say shirt sleeves, the shirt sleeves in three generations, you know, you work in the field, you know, make some money and then, you know, the next generation, uh, spins it, and then the next generation has to go back to work in the field. So, uh, <laughs> that's yeah. good. That's a good lesson. Um, what are the important jobs of being a CEO as capital allocator yeah. uh, across the business? How do you think about um, new initiatives and where to put money, what to invest in, all that? Yeah, so there, there's obviously lots of frameworks out there you can use to use to do that. Um, I'm a, um, you know, we do the Horizons framework, so that that helps a lot when we. Uh, when we think about where to make investments. Maybe, maybe for people that don't know, like, can, can you give the brief? 
So, uh, yeah, um, crossing the chasm zones to win. Jeffrey Moore. Jeffrey's come and spoken to us about it. It's just a good framework. The the four zones, and it's basically from the you know the 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 core of your business that you can't break, uh, all the way through these future investments that you want to make, and how you allocate capital across those four zones. Um, and for us, we are very um, disciplined over you know which zone we're going to put capital into. So we kind of start with our capital allocation at that level. And how much do we have to invest and where are we going to put it? So we don't, you, you want to avoid over-investing in the long-term over the horizon opportunities, um, but you want to make sure that you put the proper investments in um, the ones that are really going to pay dividends today. So, and so you, we use that as a framework where to start putting our capital. Um, but it's, it's, it gets harder and harder the bigger you get uh, with capital allocation because, you know, we service a global economy and there's this, you know, owners, general contractors, and subcontractors. There's the enterprise, the mid-market, the SMB. There's the U.S. market and these other markets that we're in, all of which have needs for resources in order to solve their needs. So it gets more and more challenging as you do so. But as long as you use a framework, and we use that framework, uh, you will get the big pieces right. Um, the other thing as a capital allocator for a CEO is, it's not just the capital you're going to, you know, that you're going to put into the business today, but like for Procore, we have to think about the capital that we have that's that we have to you know um, invest, right? So it's not it's the it's the capital that we have on the balance sheet that's not going to go into the business today. So it actually even gets more complicated as you get bigger. Um, the the good news is is that if you if you're disciplined, you will you will probably be right. Um, and the other thing is is that we have I do two things. I come up with the capital allocation and the strategy uh, with input from my leaders. Uh, and then I have them do a bottoms up and then challenge me on that. Hmm. Uh, and within that challenge comes out the answer. Uh, and that tends to be the right answer. So we do find ourselves throughout the year making small tweaks to that because you learn things and some things don't work. Uh, but also in the, uh, in the horizon four items that are over the horizon, that are the, the big bets, you tend to make shifts on those pretty re quickly because they're they're essentially startups in your organization. You're learning something new every single day. So as you guys have built more and more um, uh, product surface area, yeah. and, and I don't know, how many products do you guys have today? 11. 11. So, so as you get those off the ground uh, and, and em empowering innovation and people to um, be entrepreneurial in what they're going after while maintaining the consistency of what is the Procore platform, do you end up empowering like a GM type role to go after that and they get some cross-functional resources or what have you found about launching new products? So uh, the business, our business itself is very matrix. So we do have people that are focused on owners and, and the product organization, general contractors and specialty contractors. But the, the, the challenges that we're solving for across those three stakeholders, there's in the Venn diagram, there's about an 80% overlap. So it doesn't make sense to have them focus on the commonalities and the platform hmm. features that kind of cross those things. So uh, we do have, it's very matrix, but yes, we do have people that focus on um, the different stakeholders because the differences between each one of those stakeholders can be pretty big. Uh, you know, what an owner needs is far different than what a subcontractor needs. So, so we do, but they're not, it's not really a GM model. It's more of a, a specialized focus model. Um, and you know the the was it the Conway's law that you ship the you ship the the code that represent that that mimics your org design. We've learned that lesson over the years too. If you if you over engineer your org design um, incorrectly, you'll end up with a very inefficient um, uh, product that go, that is not going to market effectively. So we've learned that it's it's really important to get your org design right. That's one of the areas where I spend a lot of time thinking because as a business evolves, org design matters. When you go from a U.S. business to an international business, how you organize your teams get gets really, really complicated. So, uh, you know, anyway, so I, I org design matters on the international point. Like, what 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 are the lessons in in that and the org design uh, yeah. point you were alluding to there? So uh, it's really interesting, but um, from from Procore, Procore's standpoint, when we were uh, in 2017, we went to Australia, uh, New Zealand, and Canada. What we thought was going to happen was not what happened. It, it was a new motion for Procore. Obviously, we're a U.S. company. We hadn't done this before. And what we learned was it, <laughs> we were kind of spoiled by being a, a known brand in the U.S. market. And we kind of showed up, and this is being euphemistic, we kind of showed up in these new regions thinking like, we're here, you know, and everyone's like, that's great. Who are you? You know? Yeah. So uh, what we learned along the way was uh, 
the the team that does the beachhead landing or design has got to be a very small, tight, um, autonomous team uh, that basically can find the referenceable customers, uh, do the brand marketing, build build the brand, uh, and start building this organization. But much like when you invest in a small startup, it is it, it, very quickly it gets to the point where you actually need a more of a formal design because that's not going to get you to the next level. So you have to be, as a leader, you have to remember that though you have a mature organization here in the U.S., um, that little uh, startup has got to be, their, their talent has to evolve and probably has to change out mm. as you grow. So you, that's the talent side. And on the org design side, you definitely need somebody back at corporate headquarters that is, that is um, uh, helping them get the resources that they need in order to be successful. Mm. Um, and we learned that somewhat of the hard way because um, if they don't get the resources they need, they can't be successful. Um, but it's also hard to listen to a five-person team when you're running hard and fast totally. in this market. So, so do you send someone from HQ to the local market and then hire in people with the cultural expertise as well? Or how do you make that work? That has, been the, that has worked really well for us, um, primarily because of the people in the culture aspect of it. We, we basically are transplanting a, you know, a, a portion of Procore down there. Uh, that has worked very, very well for us, both in Australia, New Zealand, and uh, and in UK, Ireland, and Canada. Yeah, so that that works. There, there's a there's a trade off that exists with um, expediency of decision making, uh, and on the other hand, there's refinement of inputs, uh, yes. and those two things are at odds with one another. Um, how do you think about this trade off and being assertive and decisive, uh, but also methodical and, and thoughtful? It's, it's not an exact science uh, at all. Um, my style is I like to gather is I like to gather probably more information than most before I make a decision, but I'm also very principled. So I kind of I know where I stand on the important pieces uh, and on the pieces that are uh, newer to me or um, the blast radius is smaller, I'm going to take more time uh, uh, trying to understand. It's not really consensus building, but like like, you know, as you grow, you hire people who know more about their function than, than you do. So I really try to just ask the right questions and listen. I have this whole thing around inquiry over advocacy. Um, I would much rather sit in a meeting as a leader and ask uh, for input uh, as opposed to tell everybody what the answer is. Mm. And some leaders, some leaders actually are the opposite. They, they just, they know, the, they know the answer. They go in and tell everybody how to do their job. And we've hired people from large companies that you would know the brand of that the CEO runs the business that way, who are very uncomfortable with my leadership style hmm. because I'm very, very open and I want to hear people's input before I, you know, before I commit to a decision. Now, as my wife likes to say, the indecision is the decision. So you can't, you can't not make a decision. Um, and actually, it's funny, Steve and I used to always say, uh, people would ask us why we're successful. And we would say, we make one better decision every single day than all the bad decisions we make, you know? <laughs> but the key is, is that we make the decisions. Yeah. And um, we also look at uh, problem spaces with uh, uh, the blast radius in mind. So we very much consider what the, what the challenge, what the impact's going to be. Yeah. Uh, and that's critical. What about balancing growth and profitability? You've uh, seen this pendulum swing back and forth and yeah. you've gone from more bootstrappy to more high growth. How do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, when you, we, we actually are very fortunate to have lived through the phase of the market the way we have, which was for the first, what, um, 20, 19 years of Procore's uh, history, it was grow, 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 market share, market share, market share. And for a, uh, a business, a vertical SaaS business like Procore that's in an industry where it's going to be winner takes most, that really matters. So we had the latitude to grow kind of at, at all costs, right? Um, now, two things happened to Procore. One was uh, in 2009, we ran out of money and nobody was going to invest any more money in Procore. So we had to get really scrappy, really, by the, by the way, in the early days, we had no money too, but we, Steve and I have know how to be capital efficient because we had to, right? And so over the years, we've, we've had to have that. So it's kind of in our DNA to be capital efficient, but then we were growing, growing, growing. Uh, and then it was around three or four years ago where we started saying, okay, well, um, there are significant operational efficiencies that we can wring out of this business and, and not hamper our growth. And so we started doing that. Now we started at like negative 35% operating margins. So we yeah, had a long yeah. way to go. Uh, and then we were marching along there. And then along the way, 
the world that you live in um, changed their mind and decided that it was all that mattered was was profitability. Um, and the good news was we already had started on that journey and we had been marching away and, and giving back operating margin more and more over time. Um, and so and here we are and you know delivering um, significant operating margin last year and, and again this year. Uh, but we never do it at the, at the expense of growth. So to answer your question, we prioritize growth over o- operating margin uh, uh, slightly. So if we ever see an opportunity to grow this business, uh, we're going to make the investment if we if we feel confident in it. And fortunately for us, there's a tr- lot of things we can do. But we also know that the more we focus, allocating less capital can actually speed you up. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that is very unintuitive to a lot of founders, but it's actually true. Uh, scarcity actually drives velocity, and it's just something that we, we know. Uh, and so we don't feel like we're sacrificing anything um, and, you know, we, we, we came up with this term efficient growth, which is kind of um, just what we run the business off of. And when I said that to the leadership team, like, look, our new mantra here is efficient growth. Um, we need to make every decision kind of through that lens. I, I was wondering, like, am I going to be fighting my leaders on this? Because they're going to be like, no, no, no. I, you know, the good news was at Procore, they adopted it. And then it went throughout the entire organization. So we have people making decisions around not doing a um, catered lunch, right? Uh, which we normally would do and just go in and doing a regular lunch and doing things like that that actually uh, matter all the way through the organization. Hmm. Was there a single all hands or something that you like really galvanized uh, there was. around it? And did, was it, I assume hard for some people to shift that, that mindset? Well, I think, and that's my takeaway was uh, it was surprisingly easy for this organization. I'm not 100% certain why. I'm grateful that yeah. it was. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, I don't, I can't think of one difficult conversation I had with one leader around the fact that they weren't getting it. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. What advice do you wish you had about running a business that you would give to founders today or that you do give to founders today in the, the role of being a mentor to, to early stage companies? It's, it's all, there's nothing that matters. Well, first you have to have a good product and you have to have big TAM, right? Uh, but beyond that, it, nothing matters more than people. Uh, and so you can be fixated on uh, I know founders they get very fixated on their mission and they don't they don't spend enough time thinking about the people. Hmm. But it's all about talent, and you just have to get really really good at that, uh, and you have to get real fast. So I I wish I uh, I've developed a very strong muscle over the years and how to you know attract and retain top talent and also to jettison poor talent. But um, I wish I had I wish I had had a mentor early on who kind of taught me that because I, I everything I learned I learned somewhat the hard way. Yeah. I wish somebody would have helped me with that. And so I spent a lot of time with um, founders hmm. um, trying to figure out how to teach them that. Pricing is an important derivative of all things uh, related to the business. And you guys yep. made a conscious decision in the early days to pursue volume-based pricing versus seat-based pricing, I guess. As a, this, this is maybe a little bit of a, uh, the specifics of it might be a little niche and bespoke to, to your industry or how you guys think about it. But um, can, can you talk through that uh, that decision and how that, uh, downstream sort of impacted a bunch of business considerations as well? Yeah, so uh, this is will, will sound strange to most people that aren't in our business, but uh, we have volume-based pricing. So if you're uh, a general contractor doing $100 million a year, uh, you'll pay a certain basis points uh, based on the number of pro- pro- products of ours that you run uh, on an annual basis. Um, but let me back up and tell you how we got there. First and foremost, this business is all about connecting everyone in construction on a global platform. Owners, GCs, and subs, and material and equipment suppliers and insurers and lenders, everybody on a pro- that's involved in a project, everybody has got to be in the same ecosystem, sharing the same workflows and the same data. I knew when I started Procore that if I did a per seat license model, which is, was that was really the only pricing model that existed at the time, um, that uh, our customers were going to start making value um, decisions around, Logan doesn't need a license, he's only going to be on sure. the job for whatever. And then all these workflows would break and my vision wasn't going to happen. So, I knew early on that that wasn't going to work. So um, I remember talking to an early customer who was uh, uh, using a com- uh, client server solution that was dominant in the industry at the time. And they were a seat licensed business. And uh, he's like, well, I'm going to leave this, this, this platform, uh, not platform, this client server environment. I'm coming to Procore. And you know, how much is it going to cost? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm still trying to come up with the yardstick, right? So I said, how much, are, you know, how much volume are you doing every year? 
I actually didn't, I think I said, how much construction are you doing every year? And he goes, oh, that's really interesting you asked that because I buy my insurance based on my construction volume that I do. Uh, and he said, you know, if you're thinking about how to ma- measure my business versus a competitor or another business, construction volume is a really good indicator of the sc- size and scale of the business. And so all I did at that point was I took his per seat licensing model for, and it was like $35,000 for X number of seats. Uh, and then his volume. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to come up, I'm going to back into an equation that comes up with the number of basis points that equates to what he's paying per seats. And that was the genesis of our, of our pricing model. Uh, and it was hard in the beginning. And frankly, it's even hard sometimes today uh, for customers to, to, to buy into that. But CFOs love it because it actually, they only buy what they're going to use. Uh, and it gives them the ability to um, kind of manage their consumption. Uh, as opposed to it just being a bunch of licenses that aren't getting used. And it's aligned with their success, right? Or their their scale and their growth rather than headcount, I assume, is a little bit orthogonal in some ways to the outcome. It's exactly aligned with the, their, the, their scale of their business. Uh, it, it, our, their success and our success are, are very much aligned. Mm. Yeah, I, I want to uh, back all the way up to uh, your... your uh, path to starting Procore. Uh, okay. I would say we talked about Steve. Steve had a very traditional, uh, probably Silicon Valley, Stanford uh, experience. You did not. Uh, it wasn't a traditional educational path to being an entrepreneur. Can, no. can you talk about early days uh, and, and uh, college and yeah. what led you to the Procore? Yeah. Um, it's interesting as you kind of get to this point in life when you reflect on, your, your, uh, on everything that happened to you. Um, when I was in high school, uh, it, beca- it was very clear that I was not a good student. Um, I was curious, but um, I was only curious about the things I was curious about. And, and so uh, it turns out, um, uh, you know, I have a reading disability uh, and also that I'm what you would call like an autodidact. I, I, um, I'm, you give me something that I'm passionate about and I will become an expert on it in just a number of days. In fact, right now I'm I'm, uh, I'm going through a course right now to become a timber frame um, carpenter. Um, so I'm, I'm going to build a timber frame barn. Um, and so I'm learning all of the joinery and everything else. So like, uh, that's my personality type. That there was not, society wasn't built for people like us, right? We didn't fit the mold. Um, I, you know, my guidance counselor in high school was like, I don't know what to do with you, hmm. you know? Anyway, I go to University of Arizona uh, and I get distracted and I essentially get kicked out. Uh, and so then I have to figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, and so I go and um, become a security guard at a, my grandfather's building where he lived and lived in an assisted living uh, situation uh, and decided that I didn't want to do that. So I went back to community college and I got a 4.0 because I realized um, it wasn't about anything other than the fact I wanted to prove to the world that I was freaking smart. Hmm. So I just brute forced my way uh, you know, through some community college classes and I did pretty well. Uh, ended up being accepted into University of San Francisco's pre-med program. Uh, went, went up to the Bay Area to do that. Uh, I had a few months before this is the fall semester began. Got a job working in construction. I'd grown up in construction. I knew construction and I'm passionate about construction. Uh, anyway, the fall came and I decided that it wasn't time for me to go to school because I was having so much fun building. Um, I essentially never went back. <laughs> so I'm a, essentially a college dropout uh, without any of that experience. Uh, and, um, you know, but I found Steve and Steve had all the credentials and he was, uh, you know, he was just a great partner to Hmm. kind of bring all of that kind of credibility and learnings. Is is there a, uh, I mean, I guess follow your passion and find what you're uniquely interested in, but is there any, uh, lesson you would impart? You have a son, uh, like that, that you have shared in that whole thing that's interesting for people? Well, I think it's, again, it's know thyself, right? I know my weaknesses. Um, if you're not going to be a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or whatever, um, and you don't need to get a four-year deg- degree, you should, the sooner you recognize that, the better. Because now it's, now you're in the camp of, I have to develop a, a skill of some sort. Uh, and hopefully you have some passion around something that you can develop a skill around. But uh, I think it's really important that we find a place for the people that have as much um, passion and horsepower as I have uh, to have a place in the society where they can actually contribute. Hmm. Um, and you look, you know, a lot of um, a lot of founders are similar to me. They're, you know, they don't fit into the normal mold. Um, but if you uh, if you empower those people to actually go do what they're 
meant to do, you can get a lot out of them. It seems like we've we've uh, maybe over rotated or definitely rotated pretty far to the four year liberal arts uh, school degrees instead of the more practical, applicable things that um, translate to direct jobs in there. I know you you are passionate about this, uh, but can, yeah. can you speak about like that? That well, yeah. So uh, I, I'm so passionate about this. Um, like for instance, uh, one of the biggest crimes in America is the fact that we took shop class out of high school. Hmm. I remember, you know, shop class was just, you know, it taught me so much about how to work with my hands and gave me so much confidence that I could do things. So, um, you know, there, there, there's that aspect of it. There's, um, there's, you know, the trade schools that are out there. There's, there's so many different ways you can make a living in, in this world that isn't a liberal arts degree. Um, you know, so, um, I was just talking to all of our customers that are here on campus and we were talking about the, the labor shortage in construction and, um, you know, uh, high school guidance counselors do not get credit for sending kids to trade schools. So they get, and by the way, they, there's this perverse um, kind of incentive program, which is, you know, the, the, I think they get more points on their, on, their, on their card if they send somebody to Stanford than if they send somebody to Santa Barbara City College, and they get zero points for sending them to trade school. So there's a, this, this inverse incentive program that keeps people out of trades, which is, which is a huge crime. And so that's an area where I, I really want to focus. And then it's the stigma of entering a, a job that doesn't have the kind of the shine and polish of a, you know, doctor, lawyer, accountant um, associated with it that um, we still have to overcome. So we live in a society that I think doesn't quite understand that a pipe fitter can make six figures a year uh, being a pipe fitter and a college degree program, uh, a person that has an accounting degree might make $65,000 the first year with four years of debt behind them. And, and maybe AI is going to come for in some way, who knows, yeah. right? And it's by the a, way, AI is not installing pipe anytime soon. No, you yes. Know? We're, we're a long way away from that. <laughs> Back up to the Charlie Munger thing. I, I think he had a quote that like, I underestimate, uh, I consider myself top 1% in, uh, in um, taking into consideration incentives and I still underestimate it every day or something. It's yeah. interesting, like how many societal ways we're we're shepherding people to this path that I, I had no idea on the guidance counselor placement point system that's like discouraging, um, you know, trade schools and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do live in an interesting time. I was talking to one of our customers about that, which is for hundreds or thousands of years, society worked pretty much the same way. Like I was talking about how when I was a kid, um, I had to be home when the streetlights went out, right? That, like if I wasn't home before the streetlights went out, I was going to catch almighty hell from my mom. Uh, and then you think, you know, that was 75 years of, of that probably. Prior to that, it was, you had to be home before the sun came, came down. And then we lived through this era where now everybody's connected, right? And they're, they're always going to be connected for, forever. So we, we are going through a massive transformation of how the society runs and operates that we get this vantage point of seeing that nobody, no other generation before us was ever going to see. Uh, and it's both a, both, both a blessing and a curse. Oh, it's crazy. I mean, there's, there's, if you think about like 1600 to 1750, if you drop someone from 1600 into 1750, they, the world would look mostly the same to them. If you take someone from 1870 and drop them into today, I mean, just to think about the amount of change we've, we've had in our lifetime. And it feels like we're just on the, it's exponential, right? Yeah. It's, it's definitely compounding in a meaningful well, way. Like if somehow I had gone to sleep in 1986 when I graduated high school and you woke me up today. I would be, sh by the way, we were talking about it. We all had Encyclopedia Britannica. That's where we got our information. And we were all, I was talking to my customers about this and that, you know, if, if you had to do a, a book report on animals, uh, all the boys wanted to do it on lions and all the girls wanted to do it on horses, right? So essentially the next day when you, do, you turned in your book report, everybody gave the same book report essentially because you only had five paragraphs with the Encyclopedia Britannica to gather the, uh, the data on your subject. And, and like, what a world we live in today where... It's, it's yeah, it, it's fascinating every single day and the manifestations of it. Uh, I, I guess I'm curious, the artificial intelligence point that you guys, uh, you, you guys are witnessing, are there specific workflows or processes or things that you're observing or you see the opportunity for AI with, with Brokor's business? I just got a, a great example of one from one of our customers who's a subcontractor. Uh, subcontractors, the majority of their costs are people, right? You know, they're people fitting pipes or whatever. Um, and so if you can save, uh, if you can get the same job done with one less person, that drops into the bottom line and you're, you know, you're doing well. This one uh, company has figured out how to um, 
basically get more done with less people using AI. Essentially, getting the right person to the right job on the right day with the right material and the right, right equipment, it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, and they've, they're using patterns in their uh, data to get people to do that. And they're, they're saving so many man hours. It's, um, it's shocking. It, it was actually, you know, I think her example was they're taking a job that would take 12 people yesterday, and now they're doing the same job with the same quality, same velocity with six people. Hmm. Have you guys started to input it into your product itself? Most, defi- most definitely, yeah. So, uh, for uh, so the beauty of Procore again being a being a platform mm-hmm. is we have this corpus of data, right? And construction, though everything is a prototype, the the processes within construction are the same over and over again. So, if you're building a 120 bed hospital in Miami Dade County, um, we have in our database we have you know 3,000 of those around the U.S. or globally that we can then look for pattern recognitions and try to help identify challenges before they happen or next, next best actions for people to mm-hmm. take in the field. Um, so th- I, we were just all talking as a group um, with our customers about um, what we're going we're to look back on today and we're going to say, wow, this is, this is the time where this industry changed dramatically. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be much less of a, a lone wolf at the job site kind of trying to assemble and figure stuff out to a data-driven um, business. Yeah. And I guess you guys benefit from being uh, back to the platform point, but you have the centricity of data to make those recommendations on this is deviating from the standard pri- pricing of that pipe, or here's, you know, you're missing this part that checks a box from a, con- a compliance or safety standpoint or whatever. So well, great, here, I'll give you a great example. Um, everyone knows about the supply chain challenges. Supply chain challenges really hit the construction industry hard during COVID. Um, and most of that has worked its way out, but except for um, complex electronic equipment. Um, and so if you're building a building that requires a, you know, a lighting control system or something that has complex electronic equipment in it, um, certain manufacturers are taking about 24 months to deliver the, 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 the equipment. Well, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's forever. That will stop a job from moving forward. And that's, that's critical. We know in our system which... Uh, air handlers or which lighting control systems are actually getting delivered quickly and which ones are being delivered late. So if a contractor is putting together the, the plan in Procore for their next project and they put in a lighting control unit that we know has a 24-month lead time, we can pop up and tell them, hey, you might not want to do that. You might want to look at these three other ones hmm. that are actually coming much faster. It's th- that level of detail that will, and by the way, that that means that a project that would normally take 36 months can now take 22 months. Hmm. And that's real money for everyone. <laughs> It's fascinating. How how, um, how did an eighth grade job at a cabinet shop influence your founding journey? So I was a, uh, prior to that, uh, somewhat of a privileged kid in a privileged society down in La Jolla, California. Uh, and um, I hadn't really seen much of the world. When I walked into that cabinet shop that day and they welcomed me, I was working with uh, carpenters. And these were people that lived in a different part of town than I'd ever been to before. Uh, but they also had a different mentality than everybody else. These were like people that were craftspeople that took pride in what they were able to do. And they did things that were awe-inspiring to me with their hands. Uh, and so all of a sudden I was like, I found my people. I, it kind of sounds funny I say it that way, but I did. I'm like, I want to be like these people. Um, and by the way, my dad was a banker and I'd gone to like the big corporate boardrooms and, you know, and the bring your kid to work stuff. I had no interest in any of that. I wanted to be a craftsperson. Um, uh, so that got me excited about it, and all I wanted to do was learn. And fortunately for me, Woody um, um, Jesperson put me, who ran the company, put me into the journeyman uh, apprentice car- carpenters program at the local union hall when I was in high school, and gave me the opportunity to become a, an apprentice carpenter. Hmm. Um, and that just kind of sealed my fate. Funny thing was too, in nineteen like uh, whenever they came out, like eighty three or whatever, I got a TRS eighty computer, uh, and I loved BASIC. I loved programming. My dad was saying not that long ago to me, we were talking about like my childhood and stuff. Like if you looked at my passions, right, they, they collided into Procore. It's technology and construction. So hmm, it's fascinating. And your mom also bought, got you a book, How Things Work or something, yes. which I assume was around the same time, pretty yes. formative period. She actually, funny enough, she got it for me, but she kept it on her bedside table as I was growing up. And we would just spend lots of time going through it and just, and then, oh, and I'll, I'll never forget. So then I, I got to be um, fascinated with how things work. So I started dismantling stuff around the house. And I'll never forget, I dismantled my dad's uh, corded drill uh, and I couldn't get it back together again. <laughs> and so I kind of like put it in a drawer where he couldn't find it. And I was just waiting for him to come 
you know, and, and, and kind of ripped me apart. And he finally was looking for it. I had to fess up to the fact that I, I did it too with a carburetor. I did my, my, one of my first girlfriends had a car that and back in the day, you had a carburetor and uh, she's like, I have a problem with my carburetor. I'm like, I could fix it. <laughs> I took, I took it apart. And it was like probably, I don't know, 140 pieces. When I put it back together, there was like 17 pieces left yeah, over. Yeah, missing from the, yeah. And yeah, I'm yeah. like, oh, I am so, I am so Yeah, I assume ex-girlfriend after that. Uh, after yeah, you yeah, took yeah. Apart, she was yeah. not, she was not very happy yeah. with me. Um, the, the early days of like the original insight or the kernel for Procore was, was it actually rooted in your own home and sort yeah. of seeing how inefficient the process was? Like what was that you're, you, you guys moved from San Francisco down here to Santa Barbara uh, yeah. and your wife said, you can come with me or not, but yeah. I'm going there. So yeah. maybe, maybe take us through the, the actual kernel of insight. Yeah. So she did. Uh, so I was at the time um, doing this HR consultancy. So I was on planes all the time. I was in Charlotte and I was in Dallas. I, I was never home. Was it, was it like PeopleSoft, like, like yeah, integrations? Yeah, I actually or? putting web front ends on PeopleSoft. So PeopleSoft time was, at the time was client server. And we, I was in the interactive voice response business. Do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah. So I was putting te telephony front ends on PeopleSoft. Uh, this is before the internet. For, for people that don't know, very, very sexy stuff. But IVR, so PeopleSoft is an HR uh, company that was started by Dave Duffield, yep. Daniel Boosery, which be, they, they've now started Workday, Workday. right? Which right. is the cloud version of it. But IVR is like when you when you call a phone and it's basically like press one for this, two for this, and, and that kind of stuff. And for yes, for all the old timers, you used to have to call your bank to get your bank balance and put in nine hundred numbers to get to it. That's IVR, uh, and so it's really a technology interface to analog phones. Uh, and, and how I got into that is a whole other story. But I, um, yeah, so I was doing I was I was uh, doing that with um, um, uh, these kind of Fortune one hundred companies. Um, and traveling all over the world, putting these telephone front ends on. To, so you can enroll in your benefits program at Bank of America or whatever, because that was the way you did it. They had call centers too at the time, because if you couldn't figure out your numbers, you had to hit zero and you go to a call center. Bank of America had a call center I think they had like 300 people in it, only for Bank of America employees. So if I'm an employee of Bank of America and yeah. I need to enroll, it's open enrollment, I need employee to get my new- purchase plan. Or you and so get I'm calling to... in, now it's obviously all on the internet, I, uh, yeah. but but I'm calling in and saying, press one for this, press two for this. And that was how you did the triaging of what plan you wanted to pick or yeah, whatever. Yeah, and then I also became the the voice. So I was like the voice of Applied Materials uh, University. Oh, wow. Like, so I would, I would program the call tree and I'd be like, you know, press one for, and then I'd hit save, and then I program the call. Anyway, it was very weird, and um, but at the same time, the the industry evolved, and all of these companies started coming to me saying, "Hey, um, and I was working for somebody. Hey, do you want to? Uh, there's this new thing called the internet. Can we? Can you put a web front end instead of a tele telephony front end on the front of this?" And I'm like, "Sure." So uh, that's kind of how I I made that transition into that part of my world. So, and I, I got good at writing software for the internet. And so then you moved down here uh, in yes. 2000, 2001? Yeah. Yeah. So I eventually was, it was, uh, it was in 1999, actually. Okay. When I got the phone call, she's like, we're moving to Santa Barbara. I was in Charlotte at the time. And I'm like, no, we're not. And she said, no, yes, my, your son and I are moving there. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how we define we, but we, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We is really not you. Um, she's like, I don't see you ever anyways. And, you know, anyway, so we ended up coming down here, bought a house. Uh, she wanted to remodel it. Uh, and that's kind of where, so then I would fly in on Thursday nights and um, I, the first thing I do is go to Kinko's because I'm really I'm passionate about scheduling. So I was doing all the scheduling on this job with Microsoft Project. And so I would go to Kinko's and print out a big Gantt chart. I'd go back to the job site trailer and I'd meet all the subs. And I'm like, okay, last week you said you're going to do this. What did you do? And wh whatever, you know, and next week, what are you going to do? And so I'd write on the thing and then I'd put it back into Microsoft Project. And then anyway, uh, <laughs> what I learned was a lot of times when I showed up, a lot of things that they said that they were going to do that week didn't get done. Hmm. What I really found out was, by the way, right there is a surf spot called Rincon, which is one of the most famous surf spots in California. What I found was when there was a point break out there, um, nobody would go to work, right? And so I was I created a correlation between my schedule and the surf report. And anyway, so I'm like, wow, there's, um, th there's no certainty in the schedule, but these people all know what they need to do. So if I can web enable this, I will. So essentially I took the, that's a funny story too, but essentially I took the, the needs I had as a person building a house, watching my money fly out the door with no accountability and no, no telemetry into how it was going uh, to, I'm going to corral this whole chaos 
and I'm going to put together a system that's going to actually allow me to manage my project. Hmm. And there's probably a lot of dependencies of if this person needs to do this on that time and a bunch of derivative considerations. And so the logic building all that stuff out. Yeah. And if the carpenter, you know, Jim and the drywall, drywall or whatever, Mark, are sharing information about the, it's a six foot break. <laughs> ring yeah, They're yeah. both not going to show up. Yeah, that's funny. In your mind, what's the coolest construction project that Procore has oh, worked on? Anything that stands so out? So many cool ones. It's such a privilege. By the way, last week I, I went to go see a data center that I'd never been in a, data centers are highly secure facilities. So it's yes. like government facility. So it's, I got somebody kind of essentially sneak me into a data oh, center that was under construction. But I will say, uh, without a doubt, is uh, it's a project called ITER, I-T-E-R. It's in the south of France. It's a, I think, uh, 35 nations have come together to build a nuclear fusion reactor. Huh. Uh, and uh, it is, first of all, it's in the middle of um, south of France, so it's, it's vineyards as far as the eye can see. And then there's this machine that's the size of a city uh, that they're building there. Uh, and uh, just just to be able to walk through and be on the inside of a nuclear fusion. I was like literally inside the uh, the fusion reactor itself. Uh, it's not done yet. But yeah, yeah. You know, you're like, I can't believe I'm able to do that. And the scale is just Yeah, remarkable. you say a city. I mean, how big is it? Is it actually? It's um, it's a it's a whole complex of buildings that are the size of, in some cases, like multiple sports arenas put together. Wow. And, you know, ceilings that are, you know, I don't know, 150 feet high. Like it's, it's, yeah. And bolts that are this big around, like it's, this stuff's big. But by the way, if you think about it, when they conquer this fusion, uh, the world's going to change, mm -hmm. right? The dependency on energy is going to hopefully go away. And I just look at it like, man, the things that we're building are going to change the world. And it's a privilege to be able to see, you know? That's super cool. Um, we talked about you mentoring founders and getting to meet early stage founders, but but I heard you say that you uh, have gotten good at figuring out who has the fire in the belly to like go the distance on that. I guess that's partially uh, my job as well, but I'm curious, are there any things that you've you found either question wise or deterministic, uh, th it, like uh, things you can figure out from that? You know, it's funny. The best the best way I, I, I kind of test it is I challenge them on their beliefs around their product and their mission and their vision. And the ones that just take the punch and come right back and have, you know, and basically are bought in are the ones that I believe are going to have the, the, the kind of the kinetic energy necessary to get through. Hmm. Uh, it's funny. Um, so there's a technology, uh, program at UCSB for people. It's like an entrepreneurial program. And so I've talked to them several times and they'll, they'll come down here. Um, and I'll get, I'll often get the question, which is like, you know, um, I'll ask people like, what do you want to do? And when people that answer, I want to be an entrepreneur, I'm like, that's not a thing, right? Like you don't become an entrepreneur. That's like, a basket of like a category. There's like specific things underpinning that. Right. And really what it is, is that you're going to do something that is, is, is novel and unique more than somebody else. And you're going to deliver value that hasn't been discovered yet, uh, in a way that's going to make you differentiated in the marketplace. Then people say you're an entrepreneur, but it, so I, I always say to them, like, I'm like, you want to be careful because people that say they want to be an entrepreneur, they haven't found the thing. So you just want to be careful that you're not, you're not just doing this because you admire people who are successful entrepreneurs and you want to, you want to be Mark Cuban, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't be Mark Cuban, right? Like you, you can go do something and you can, but, but I, I'm very cautious of founders that are doing it for the wrong reasons. Interesting. And so, so does that mean that they need, there needs to be a unique insight and resonance with the problem that they're going after rather than just wanting to solve something and finding the opportunity within it? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And better, and hopefully they actually really understand the problem space that they're getting into. Uh, and that means that they've either been exposed to it. It's something they're knowledgeable about. And it's also funny with these, tech, with these um, entrepreneurial programs, which is, most of the products that they're building up there are related to student issues. Oh, like, of course. You know, yeah. Like, oh, textbook aggregation or student housing or whatever. And I'm like, you realize students have very little money, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's it's their their only exposure. Right, it's their right. worldview is, uh, yeah, it's one they of did, the- They didn't have the privilege of being in the eighth grade and working in a cabinet that's shop. Right, you know? That's right, that's right. Yeah, it, it's a funny thing that uh, it's hard to, without working to some extent, especially with B2B problems, consumer, you can have a unique insight just as a, person in the world, but with B2B, you're not really entitled to an opinion about 
construction platforms unless you are somewhere in the industry or have some exposure to it. Right. right. So it's interesting. Well, the, the beauty of our industry too is a lot of people, so the construction industry is huge. A lot of people grow up, you know, their families and I mean, everyone seems to be in construction or knows somebody in construction. So, uh, but it's even more, you know, uh, out there. Like, I don't think a college grad is going to write legal software, right? Yes. You know? Uh, but they might be able to, you know, compete with Procore because there's a lot of people that understand construction. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we were just talking about, uh, you know, random points of serendipity along the journey of people that intervened and sort of changed the course of your your life uh, as we as we wrapped. I'm curious. It sounds like someone comes to mind. Yeah. Well, by the way, there's there's a handful because I think we all have them. But the one that really comes to mind is someone I I wish I could find, and I I don't think I'll ever be able to find this person again. But it's when I was um I was being I was a carpenter in the Bay Area before I was supposed to go back to to USF, uh, and I, it was a late in the afternoon on a Friday. I was working on building a deck for some high net worth person um, under the Sutro Tower, uh, in the Bay Area, and um, the uh, personal assistant to the owner of the house would come out every day and we'd have lunch together and just talk. And it was a Friday, and it was the end of the day, and I was putting my tools away, and she walked out and she goes. She goes, you know, Tui, I, um, I think I'm, I'm just going to, I want to say something to you. And I said, what? She goes, you seem like you're in the wrong job. You seem like, you, you know, you grew up in a good family. You seem pretty intelligent. You seem like you could be doing more than what you're doing or building a deck right now. And I went home that day. I quit my job. The next day, a guy named Skip Steveley, who was running a technology company in the Bay Area, literally knocked on my front door and offered me a technology job out of another story, which was, should have never happened, but I just happened to be home because I quit my job. And that would have not happened if this person hadn't had given me that thought. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And I wish, I don't remember her name and I, I, I but yeah. But I changed the course of, of the, and, 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 yeah, I mean, the, the randomness and the serendipity of some of these interventions, I, uh, yeah, I, we were saying like, uh, the folks at Lead Edge, Nime Meta, who is one of your investors, like sort of connected me with Battery, which otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten hired in the venture. I had nothing that jumped out from my resume that said, oh yeah, this person is going to make it, which is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm indebted to them for, for having done it as they remind me occasionally. Uh, and we, so we all have these people and we all have to be, take a moment. I, and I always say like, and sometimes I'm shaving in the morning and I have a moment where I'm just like, there's like four or five people that without their kind of belief in me, I don't know if I would be doing what I'm doing today. Yeah. You know, it's cool. You've taken to building complex Lego, Lego structures as like a therapeutic exercise. Uh, can you speak to why you enjoy this so much? It's funny how uncomfortable of a subject this used to be for me. Because, oh, really? Because, well, because it's like, I had somebody make fun of me one time, like I'm a grown adult and they were making fun of me like um, about it. And I was like, I'm like, I can't believe that I'm, I'm reacting like a sixth grader on this yeah, one. Yeah, the bullies but, uh, from, yeah. Yeah, but um, uh I'm a builder at heart. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm doing this whole carpentry program right now to become a timber frame carpenter. Uh, and uh, so I'm always wanting to build something. It's not always practical to put your tool bags on and go out sure. you know, and build stuff. What I like about Lego or two, th two for twofold. One is you get the satisfaction of building. By the way, same as a business, right? Every day I'm building Procore. Like I, I look at that. That's probably one of the reasons why I'm so engaged with Procore, I'm, I'm never done building it. But with a Lego set, like you start with something and when you're done an hour later, you've, you've actually done something, even if it's a component of something bigger. And you get this sense of satisfaction of actually doing something, building something. Uh, so for me, it's that. The other is, is that, um, and my wife will attest to this, Procore consumes me, right? Um, she always goes, God, I hope someday if you're not at Procore, you figure out like, you figure something else out. Yeah, because, another passion. Yeah, because this is like, this is all you do. And so it really does help me shut off the kind of never ending problem solving Procore engine sure. that's in my head uh, and allows me to like not think about it. I also like to hike a lot. In the, and I find that if I go off the trail and I, and I rock hop up the, up the riverbed, um, it's the same, such, the same sensation. You can't stop and you can't mid, mid hop stop and think about Procore. If you get your foot footing wrong, you're going to fall and yeah, kill yeah. yourself. Yeah. So like, I find like doing things like that are great distractions as well. Interesting. Yeah. Have you, have you ever looked at Lego's business? Oh yeah. Uh, by the way, I just listened to a podcast, uh, three part. I, it is fascinating. 
It's yeah, insane. How they, and how they started off with the with, with like they were a toy company and they were failing and yeah, yeah. It's a fascinating uh, company uh, and and structure and all of that. Really, I impressive. really want to meet the current CEO. I, I I'm very uh, very interested in in the way he thinks about the world. How do you use Lego in the business? So we have a. Um, uh, we we have a program where we educate uh, students. Uh, we want to really get them excited about construction early on. We partner with Apple to do some stuff, and we we're very interested in solving the labor problem. And we we think what's the best way to do that? Let's get them young. So we have a a, a Lego game that we have put together. Uh, in fact, uh, and so the students uh, use Procore to build a Lego building. Um, and there's you know. RFIs that have to happen, there's submittals that, and there's change orders that have to happen along the way. And actually the building that they're building is this building. It's, oh, no a, way. it's an exact replica. So it's a full board game with an instruction manual and as well as an access to Procore. How old are these students? Uh, we do K through 12. We also, uh, <laughs> I, I've done it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, All of us kids. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, it's a really good way to get people to kind of understand what Procore does. Can you custom... Uh, Commission things from Lego to to you build s- designs you of your building. You certainly can. Oh, there, interesting. But there's a whole industry out there around this where, yeah, you can go and have you can send a set of blueprints of your house and they'll they'll make you a replica of it. That's fascinating, and it's actually Lego proper. It's not like some offshoot derivative no, brand. I don't believe in the offshoots. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm, we have a purist. At I'm heart a purist. Here. If it's not Lego, it's not Lego. What's your what's your uh, what's your favorite structure that you've actually built? Uh, I just finished. Um, uh, Notre Dame. Oh, cool. And it's like a 9,000 piece and it weighs 40 some odd pounds. And it's how long huge. does that take? Well, it's funny. People keep asking that. And I, I do it in fits and starts. Yeah, got it. So like I'll do it at like an hour and a half after dinner or whatever. Sort of episodic. So yeah, it's, you know, if I added it all up, it's probably 30 hours. Wow. And what do yeah. you do with them? Are they displayed around your house or you break, <laughs> them, break them down? No. Uh, well, the two, two quick stories. Uh, my wife will not let them stay in the house. She, it, she, yeah. she, she refuses to. <laughs> Uh, so we send. Sounds them to, like she's a she's a tough customer. She runs a tough uh, ship mm-hmm. in how. Uh, 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 There's this. something to be said for having a uh, having a strong wife. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, talk about humble. Like she keeps me as humble. She, that's good. She, that's she, what you need. She yeah. is so unimpressed with me, Logan. Oh, that's it is, good. It is yeah, absolutely yeah. remarkable. So we send these things to our regional offices. So like uh, our Dublin office has the Titanic. Oh, cool. And uh, you know, in, um, the the Paris office got the Eiffel Tower, and like you know, so I do that. Plus I um. I selfishly keep, I have a kind of a man cave up at my ranch. Um, and so I keep the construction equipment ones I built. Like I built a D11 bulldozer and I just built a construction crane. That's, and you can control it with your iPhone, you know, the hook, the, the crawler and everything. It's really pretty cool. That's fascinating. It's a fa- so, 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 uh, you finished Notre Dame recently, but is that the favorite of? Well, yes. You know, the funny one on the favorite was I built the Millennium Falcon, um, which was uh, it's probably eight thousand pieces. Totally, also huge and big. And I actually bought that. One of my uh, partners is uh, kids are really into it, and so as a thank you, he got me to come over to uh, Red Point. And as a thank you, I bought the Millennium Falcon for his son to do. So well, it's a, it's a, it's it, it was probably my favorite. It was really intricate. But the funny thing was, I'd been working on it for a long time, and it was on the dining room table, and it was done. And my wife's like, "Okay, well, that thing's got to get out of here." And I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I can't really do it now. And she's like, well, we have people coming over. And so she's, we had this, uh, like a uh, piece of furniture in the dining room. It was really tall. She's like, well, why don't you put it up there? No one will see it. Right. So we pushed a chair up against the piece of furniture and I went over to the table and I, I held it and I put it up above my head and I'm step up on the stair on the one foot up on this, on the um, chair and the chair fell and I fell over backwards. No way. And you know, 8,000 pieces exploded. Right. And it was funny. You're scurrying my, around, picking it up before people come over. Well, and, well, the first thing that happened was my wife started crying because she had seen me put like 40 hours of my life into this thing. And she's like, I just made him break this thing. Oh. But it was the moment where we both realized I don't care about that much about them after they're done. Totally. It's the project I care about. So like swept it up, put it in a garbage bag, gave it to a, my friend's kid and let him go off and do it again. There's an interesting uh, lesson there to bring it all the way back to the picking the board members you work with and the people on the journey, like the process, if you're not enjoying the process, the outcome isn't that satisfactory, right? There's not like some hill you climb and get to the other side and you're like, I've, I've totally made it. You find new hills or things to compare yourself to along the way. I had never thought of it this way, but you are 100% right, which is I am much more interested in the journey than the destination. Yeah. Though I like the destination has this nirvana state, but I also re- realistic it's never going to happen. 
Uh, but there are certain people that are only fixated on the on the nirvana state. Um, but yeah, I, I I take a perverse, a passion that kind of enjoyment out of the chaos that's today. The process of it. Yeah. All. It's interesting because I'm sure you've now found that you just recalibrate to new expectations. And so when you're talking to Satnia Nandela or Toby from Shopify or whatever, now you have a new peer set. Once upon a time, your peer set was just the people in the construction industry trying to get by. And so if you're too fixated on the the outcome, you're just going to recalibrate to new people. And so you'll always feel uh, unsatisfactory of where you're going because Satya is running a bigger business or Toby or whatever it is, yeah. right? It's just yeah, like yeah. you have to enjoy the journey of it all because otherwise you recalibrate in yeah. some ways. Yeah, no, it's uh, I live in this very interesting world where uh, I'm solving a problem that most people don't know or care about. But um, yeah, this is this is this is my world and I'm having a blast. It's a fun one. Well, thank you for doing this. This was great. Fun conversation, Logan, yeah. always. Yeah, so it, thank you.